In this video, we've got some S-Plan fault finding and diagnosing on some weird wiring centers. We've got a job that I went to for a gas leak and I felt like I opened up a can of worms with how many issues I had to solve after the gas leak. We've got some diagnosing on why hot water isn't working on this old Valent Turbomax. And we've also got boiler fault finding where I've had to start getting involved, ripping off tiles, manufacturers blaming me for faults, me blaming them for faults. And yeah, that job by itself was quite fun. But this is a day in the life of a gas engineer. This is a collection of all the different jobs I go to, how I diagnose, how I fix jobs. I hope you enjoy. Let's get into the first job. For this job, we've got a no hot water fault, but this time it's on an S plan. So we're going to get into some S plan fault finding and figure out what is going on. So you can see the thermostat is cooling for hot water, but on the boiler, there's no demand. So the first thing I do is inspect the wiring center. <laughs> And you can see that this has got to be one of the most organized wiring centers that's ever been made. <laughs> but let's look at the bright side. At least all of these are numbered so I know which cables are what. So if we open up the gas Bible and we go to chapter 2, which is all about mastering wiring, go down to section 23, S plan sequence of operation specifically for hot water. I've put a snippet of what we need for this job. So on this page, it will show you the specific sequence. Everything will go through all the way from the beginning to the end of how the hot water will work. And on that same page, it shows us that the best way to fault find is to work backwards with that sequence. So the first thing we we'll look for is if there's any fault codes on the boiler, we know there's not. So the next thing we'll look for is to see if we've got 230 volts on our orange cable. You can see here, I'm not getting any power between earth and the orange cable. So now what I'm going to test is if I've got power on the brown cable and also the grey cable. You can see here I'm getting 240 volts, so all good between brown and earth and grey and earth. So that goes to show us that we've got a faulty zone valve. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start taking out these cables for the old zone valve and put in a new zone valve. But if you want an explanation and understanding of why we test certain cables, then all of that is explained in the gas Bible. You can get more information about the gas Bible by clicking on the link in the description below this video. But in terms of this wiring, last thing we need to disconnect is the earth. That's it. Now that that's out, we just need to disconnect the zone valve from the body. Now in terms of doing it, pretty simple. Just pull the little tab and it will wiggle up. So in terms of the new zone valve, exactly the same process, just in reverse order. So now I'm just identifying which terminal blocks are which, putting the cables back in, and then I can pop the zone valve back on the body. So if we go to the thermostat and call for a demand again, we can see that little leg on the zone valve is now loose. The micro switch has been activated. So if we take a look at the boiler now, we can see we're getting a demand and everything is all good. For this job, customer complained that the hot water isn't getting hot, it's getting lukewarm at best. So I go to the tap, open it to test it, and it's only getting lukewarm. I then test the other taps in the house, the showers, and they're all doing exactly the same thing. So there's an issue somewhere. So if we flick open our gas bible and we go to section 6, common boiler issues and what to do, you'll find a section dedicated to the boiler fault of hot water only being lukewarm. Now, I can't put all of the reasons here because it will take up the entire screen. So I've just put the one that was applicable for this job. So following the gas Bible, I've isolated the cold mains going into the boiler and there's still water coming through on the hot side of the tap. So now I know there's nothing wrong with the boiler. I can look elsewhere. And in terms of this job, the issue was with this mixer tap. Now, I did have to take off a tile because they didn't put any access panels or isolation valves on this. So I've cut the pipe and just quickly thrown on two push fits because that's what I had in my bag at the time. Turn the water back on and you can see even though the cold is isolated, we're still getting water come through on both sides, the hot side and the cold side. So there's definitely an issue with this tap. Now, most of the time it is with the cartridge. But the strange thing is, this is a brand new tap, so there shouldn't be any issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to open this up and we're going to find out what's going on. So I changed the cartridge for a brand new one, put it all back together and tested it. And there was still hot water coming on the hot and cold side. And at this point I'm thinking, what? That makes no sense because again, the cold pipe is completely capped off. So that shouldn't be happening. So I was a bit stuck. So I thought, let me just put on a brand new tap. So I went to the van and I had a kitchen mixer tap. 
put that on and it was perfectly fine. The cold side was fine, the hot side was fine. So I inspected this unit and if you look there on that small right circle, there's a crack. So I think what's happened is that crack is mixing the hot and cold. So this actual brass unit itself is faulty, which is such a rare thing, especially because it's brand new. So I went upstairs to the bathroom, which is exactly the same layout, and I compared it to the downstairs one, and that one was fine. So unfortunately, the customer did just get a bad tap. So I've had to adjust the tile a little bit and make the hole a little bit bigger so I can take out the old tap. So I've already put the flexies onto this tap. So now all I need to do is just guide it through this hole, screw it to the little wooden frame there. And then hopefully where I've taken off that tile, I'll have the space to put two isolation valves and then tie it up with two spanners. So hot and cold water are connected. I've screwed this back to that wooden frame there. I tested it before I put this plate back and I siliconed it. So that was the issue. The issue was unfortunately the customer bought a faulty unit, but we've got that swapped over, make sure everything's level. We've got everything screwed on and it's all working. For this job, the customer said they've got no hot water, but the heating works fine. So initially I diagnosed this wrong and I'll tell you why. When I ran the hot tap, it seemed like the boiler was getting a demand because it would fire up, but then after a couple of seconds, it would cut out. So straight away, my mind automatically went to, oh, it's probably the plate. But when I shut the hot tap, I noticed that every now and then, the boiler would still fire up, even though there's no demand being called for. So then I thought, okay, that's a bit strange, what's going on? Then I realized the reason why the boiler keeps firing up, even though there's no demand being called for, is because of the plate preheat function. So now I know that when I'm opening the hot tap, the boiler isn't receiving a demand. We can confirm this with the status code. So as you can see, the tap is running, but we're getting S24, which is related to the boiler firing up for the preheat function. What we should be getting is S14. So now I'm testing to see if the flow turbine is activating and telling the boiler to fire up and do my test, it's not. So the flow turbine is faulty and we need to change it. So this is the flow turbine here and uh, there's two ways you can replace it. You can either just replace the little plastic flow turbine inside or you can replace the whole brass body. I think it's a lot easier just to replace the plastic inside instead of replacing the whole brass body. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. After we've isolated the cold water going into the boiler, all we need to do is remove that metal clip there. And there's two ways you can do it. If you've got long nose pliers that are thin enough to fit in those little two circles there, then all you need to do is squeeze those two circles together. That'll make the clip smaller and it will pop out. If you don't, then you can also use two very small flathead screwdrivers. And what you do is you just use your right hand and your left hand, you squeeze them together and the clip will pop out. From there, it's as simple as wiggling the flow turbine out. So you can already see that the old one is finished, but if we just compare how they spin, you can see that one spins a lot better. So putting a new one in now, really simple, just slides in, and then all of a sudden, I'm feeling something rub on my leg, and I'm thinking, what is that? And then I turn around and I'm greeted by this guy here. I don't know what it is about dogs. You can go to a job, and if there's a dog there, it automatically makes the job 10 times better. <laughs> So yeah, he did slow me down a little bit, but he was all good. So yeah, so now that we've got the flow tire band in, we just need to get the clip in. Now, I know I love to label myself as the king of one-handed repairs, but with this job, I honestly, I couldn't record it with me doing one hand. It's too challenging. You need to use one hand to squeeze the clip in and then the other hand to push it in place. So yeah, I couldn't record myself putting it in, but it's the same process as taking it out. Either use a long nose plier or use two flathead screwdrivers and push them together. Now we can turn the water back on, make sure there's no leaks, but most importantly, check that we're getting the right status codes now when we're running the hot tap. And there you go, S14, that's what we should be getting. And when I check the hot water, it's heating up properly now and the issue is resolved. 
For this job, we've got a gas leak. Now this one is pretty easy because there's only one gas appliance, which is a boiler and the gas pipe has been running track pipe. So it's only gonna be leaking by the meter or underneath the boiler. So when I get my sniffer and I put it on the connection under the boiler, you can see straight away it's leaking. So me being me, I get excited. Ah, oh, this is an easy fix. All I gotta do is tighten it up, do a tightness test and we'll be out. But I get my biggest spanners I can find. I put all of my strength into tightening it. And for some reason, it's still leaking. So obviously there's something wrong. So now I need to strip back this little yellow tape and figure out what's going on. So after stripping back the yellow tape on the back of the pipe, I found this little brown spot that you can probably see there. And for some reason, this pipe has corroded. So no matter how much I tighten this pipe, it's not gonna get rid of a hole in the pipe. So I stripped the tape back a bit more, cut out the part of the hole, and now I'm gonna redo this track pipe connection. Now the bottom section of this fitting is done. For the top section, it is just a normal compression. So I put a little bit of paste and now I'm just gonna line it back up with the existing gas pipe that goes to the boiler, tighten up the nut, and then hopefully that should be it. Now trying to catch the thread on this was a little bit fiddly for a few reasons. The first is the track pipe gets sliding down because of the weight of it. And secondly, the track pipe wasn't lining up straight because obviously a track pipe it bends so it's not coming up straight compared to the gas pipe so i had to try continuously push the track pipe up whilst twisting the angle of the track pipe to make sure it lines up with the gas pipe and it was just a little bit fun so i get my grips out and i feel like that's a little bit easier but i thought i'd leave this in the footage because you might find it interesting seeing how i do it now at this point the gas leak is pretty much sorted all i need to do is pull up this little yellow sleeve tidy it up and that should be it was doing my standard safety checks on the boiler before i leave and guess what <laughs> i'm getting emissions on the air side of the flu so now we've got a bigger problem the flu has failed somewhere so now i'm just going to use my analyzer to try figure out where it's coming from and where i'm getting the highest readings from it seems like i'm getting it from the seal that sits directly on top of the heat exchanger so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try pop this flute elbow off with minimal damage and see what's going on. Now straight away you can see that that seal right there hasn't been sitting properly. And the crazy thing is that's probably been like that since the boiler's been installed. And it's crazy to think that no one's picked up on that or tried to rectify it since the boiler's been installed. But main thing is we've caught it now. I'm gonna inspect the rest of the flue to see if anything else has been leaking. It looks like it's also been leaking there as well. So I'm gonna change both the seals on the flue and hopefully that should sort the issue. Okay, so flute elbow is sorted, emissions are good, but now when I'm frying up the boiler, I'm getting this noise. This noise usually happens when the venturi needs to be cleaned. So now we're also gonna give this boiler a strip down service. Now I'm just gonna speed through the footage of this because I don't wanna make this video too long, but it's quickly disconnecting everything, opening everything up. The main heat exchanger wasn't that dirty, so it didn't take too long to clean. But I cleaned it all down with a brush, sprayed some water on it after to flush everything through. Now, if you ever try to tell me that you've never forgot to put this cap back on when you're flushing through the heat exchanger, then I'm going to call you a liar. Because <laughs> even to this day, sometimes I almost forget to put it on. But yeah, really important to put this on when you're flushing it through. Otherwise, water just shoots out everywhere onto the PCB and it's a mess. But clean this with some wire wool, it's looking much better now. So when we put it all back together, it shouldn't be making that vibrating noise anymore. 
But finally, that's this job done now. So sorted the gas leak, sorted out the flue elbow and also gave it a full strip down service. This boiler is back up and running now. And that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed. I don't know if the microphone could pick it up or not. I don't know if my voice sounded different. I've got a little bit of a cold at the moment, but nothing too major. Um, that aside, I hope you learned something. If not, I hope I entertained you a little bit. Any questions, let me know in the comments below and I will see you in the next video.